Good evening, everyone, um, and thank you very much for joining us. It has now stopped raining, now that we're all seated inside comfortably. Um, I'm David Madigan. I'm the Executive Vice President and Dean of the Faculty of Arts and Sciences here at Columbia University. I am absolutely delighted to welcome you to this event, Diplomacy in the Digital Age, organized by the World Leaders Forum in cooperation with the European Institute and the International Media Advocacy and Communications Specialization at SIPA, the School of International and Public Affairs here at, at Columbia. It is truly a great pleasure and honor to have with us Ambassador Matthew Barzen, Ambassador of the United States to the United Kingdom, who will discuss with us the potential and the challenges of digital technologies and media for today's diplomats. Ambassador Barzen is particularly well placed to tell us about diplomacy and about the digital world. He was one of the very first in the 1990s to start his business career in an internet company at CNET Network, so he's a dot-com veteran, of which he became Chief Strategy Officer and Executive Vice President. He was also one of the first to leverage the power of the internet in modern politics, as he played leadership roles in both of President Obama's electoral campaigns. In his diplomatic posts, he has been US Ambassador to the United Kingdom since 2013, and he served before as Ambassador to Sweden from 2009 to 2011. There is another reason why I am particularly delighted to welcome Ambassador Barzen to Columbia University and why he should feel especially at home here. His grandfather, Professor Jacques Barzen, was one of our most illustrious professors here at Columbia. He was born in France and educated at Columbia after World War I. Jacques Barzon became one of the leading American public intellectuals of the mid-20th century. A prolific scholar, he helped launch the discipline of cultural history. In both his life and in his work, he constantly brought together European and American cultures. So it, was with great, it is with great pleasure that we pay tribute to the legacy of Jacques Barzon as we welcome you, Ambassador, this evening. Thank you for being with us today. We are very much looking forward to hearing your thoughts about diplomacy and about your experiences as an American envoy in Europe at a moment when the continent is facing so many daunting challenges. I'm also delighted to introduce Professor Adam Tooze, who is Catherine and Shelby Cullum Davis Professor of History and Director of the European Institute here at Columbia, and Professor Alexis Wachowski, who is Adjunct Assistant Professor of International and Public Affairs at SIPA and Director of Research and Communications at the Harmony Institute. Adam Tooz and Alexis Wachowski will moderate the discussion and the, the uh, Q&A session that will uh, um, follow from the, uh, Ambassador Barzin's remarks. I will now give the floor to Ambassador Barzin, but before that, please join me in giving a warm Columbia welcome to the Ambassador. Good evening. Great to be here. David, where'd you go? David, thank you for that introduction. Thanks for having me to Columbia. And for reasons you mentioned, it's a very special place for me because of this connection with my grandfather. And so quite literally, I wouldn't be here without Columbia because you invited me tonight. But if it weren't for my grandfather, I wouldn't have had my wonderful father. And he met my mother here in New York, right around here. Um, and then I came along. But they had the wisdom to move me out of New York to Boston at an early age. I was chumming for some booze. <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a diplomat, after all. Um, but it's also great to have my aunt and uncle here uh, tonight, who, um, actually, you guys met in London, didn't you? Okay, so they met in London. Oh, yeah. It's better if you met in London. So they come over and they get married at our house. I grew up in this little tiny town in Lincoln, Massachusetts, about 4,000 people right outside of Boston. And so it was nice to meet people who had been in London and I got to hear about London because up until that point, and so many of you are so young, but those of us of a certain age, back in the 70s, you know, we had like three and a half channels on TV. So my only experience with the United Kingdom was Monty Python, Doctor Who, and Benny Hill which was strange, so you sort of balanced out, so thank you for giving me a better sense. Um, and then New York comes in again, so I headed over there uh, two years ago, roughly, uh, August of 2013, and I was given lots of advice from my friends, uh, some of whom are in the room today, from New Yorkers uh, who either were British or had spent some time there, and they warned me, and they said, Matthew, uh, beware of the British press. They will build you up and they will tear you down. It's like, okay. So the very next day, I'm still in America at this point. I haven't even, I've been announced that I'm going over there, but I haven't yet gone. 
and an article in a major newspaper appears in which I am described as a potato with hair. <laughs> so it's like, that great, that's the building up bit. I was just <laughs> bracing for the tearing down. And then I actually do get over there a few weeks later. It's day six. And uh, at that point, think back, August 2013, David Cameron goes before parliament asking for the use of military force against the Assad regime for the use of chemical weapons. And as you remember, it's a big debate here in America. It's a big debate over there. He ends up losing the vote. Um, and after he lost the vote, front page of the number one most circulated newspaper in the UK is a big thing above the fold. It says, death notice, special relationship, dead, age 67, beloved offspring of Franklin Delano Roosevelt and Winston Churchill, blah, 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 funeral to be held at the French embassy. <laughs> so I get an email from these same friends in New York who had warned me, and they said, well done, Matthew seven decades in the making, and you've killed it in less than seven days. So of course it didn't die that day, and it's still alive and well, and it's complicated, and it's vibrant, and it's vital, and I hope in the question and answer we can get into your suggestions and your thoughts about that. But what brings us today is um, uh, diplomacy in the digital age, um, and uh, I was thinking the other thing I'm trying to adjust to in the UK is language. Right, famously similar but different, and you fall into traps. And um, I remember um, early on watching the, the BBC weather, and there's a storm, I mean, nothing like today, like a terrible storm ravaging the UK. And there's like, people are like getting swept out to sea, it's a big deal. Uh, and I'm watching the BBC, and there's, uh, the, the weather reporter is there on the Brighton Pier, south coast of England. Huge rollers coming in behind her, pouring rain. And she says, you know, I don't remember her real name, but I'm Jane Smith signing off from Brighton Pier where it is not overly safe. <laughs> so one of the big challenges for me is adjusting to that understatement. Because you can imagine what the American broadcasters would say, you know. Um, but the other one is tricky is these things. So they're not cell phones, they're called mobile phones. And you think about that phrase for a second, mobile phone. Back in the 70s, when some of us were growing up, mobile phones was an oxymoron, right? Phones were many things. They were red over in the UK in boxes. They were on every street corner here in New York. Anything but mobile, chained to your desk, chained to the wall. Now, for my kids, mobile telephone is redundant. They've never met a phone that isn't mobile, right? But what we've all been through together is this journey from oxymoron to redundancy. And I think about that for today's discussion around digital diplomacy. I mean, there are a bunch of people, wind back the clock, not too far, and some today, who would argue that digital diplomacy is an oxymoron. Proper diplomacy happens in behind closed doors, usually where you have to leave your cell phone outside. Right, that's where real diplomacy happens. Um, others look forward to a day when that phrase will be redundant. I mean, digital is part of all of our lives now, and so too it will be with diplomacy. But right now, today, we're in this interesting middle between uh, oxymoron and redundancy. So I wanted to just share with you sort of field notes, if you will, from my experiences thus far, reflect a little bit on diplomacy, um, digital, and then maybe at the end a thought about age, which I think is important. So diplomacy, so I was uh, at a dinner party the other night in London and uh, I got seated next to this famous comedian. So think, his name is Jimmy Carr. He's sort of famous over there, like sort of a John Stewart, Stephen Colbert guy, but he's also a stand-up comic. Sitting there at dinner, I knew him a little bit, but I was excited and I had this question I always wanted to ask a stand-up comedian and I never had the chance, so this was my chance. He's sitting right to the left of me and I said, Jimmy, let's say you're trying out new material and you get up there in front of a, an audience, and let's say you leave London, because that's a tough crowd, but you go to Leeds or someplace sort of in the middle. Uh, and you're trying out 10 new jokes. How many get a laugh when you first try them out? Any stand-up comedians here? Okay. So he says, well, like now? Like I'm really good, I'm at the top of my game. I was like, yeah, Jimmy, now. And he said, now I'll get three laughs out of 10. So I, 
I was like, that's really cool. Okay, that's good, because one of the things we're trying to do at the embassy is increase our ability to take risks, and it's, it's a sort of a risk-averse culture for a lot of good reasons, but so I thought, wow, three out of 10, you know, like in baseball, that's good, but in little else is three out of 10 a good score. So I'm sort of done with Jimmy. He has given me the answer I want. But then he sort of taps me on the shoulder and he says, Matthew, you know, jokes are funny things. And he's like, no, I didn't mean it that way. He's like, jokes are interesting things. And I said, or strange things. And I was like, well, tell me why. And he said, well, if you sing a song and nobody likes it, it's still a song. And if you put on a play and everybody walks out, it's still a play. But if you tell a joke and nobody laughs, it's just a sentence. I was like, turned back to Jimmy. I was like, wow. I was like, that's real. I was like, have you said that before? He's like, I've never said that before. I was like, do I have permission to quote you? And he said, sure, I don't know why you would. And I was like, I think that's actually very profound for the work that we are trying to do in diplomacy. Because his point was, the joke is a, it's more than a two-way thing. You say the sentence, there's laughter on the good ones, and this third thing is created, the actual joke. And if you don't believe me, not here, but go Google, someone uploaded a Bill Cosby, who's been in the news, a Bill Cosby uh, stand-up routine and edited out all the laughter. Mm -hmm. And it is really, I'm diplomatic, I'll just say, it's worth watching. <laughs> and it really proves this point, to watch what it's like if you take the laughter out. And so I think about digital diplomacy and you know, tweeting is an obvious thing you do. I do a fair amount of it, I'm sure lots of people here in the room do, and I think, wow, at its best, it's, you get this response and it maybe rises to the level of what he means by a joke. But how often are we just sending out 140 character sentences at people? You know? And what's our hit rate? And are we as good as Jimmy at three out of 10? I wonder. So that's some of how I think about diplomacy as it relates to digital. Quick trivia question. A major business school, it shall remain nameless because of where we are put out a case study about the company that went digital and beat Encyclopedia Britannica, like a 300-year-old, you know, famous brand. Do you know what it was? Yeah, usually we get the guess, which we did up front here, Wikipedia. It is a good answer. It is not the right answer, but thank you for playing along. Yes, it's Microsoft Encarta. And I love this. And, and, um, so Microsoft, which at the time was the richest country in the world in terms of market capitalization, decides to go, go beat Britannica at what it does best. And it goes purely digital, right? And it pays the same amount or slightly more, I think, than Britannica paid people. And it's rigorous in its, um, uh, in its process. And they build it up. Do you remember them on CD-ROMs, right? So they go do it. Um, and for something like six months, they actually do beat Britannica. But of course, how many of you have used Encarta in the last year? They finally stopped doing it. How many have used Encyclopedia Britannica in the last year? Some of us, okay. How many have used Wikipedia? How many of you have found a mistake? How many will use it again anyway? Okay, just checking. And so it turns out that the guy who founded Wikipedia is Jimmy Wales. He lives about three blocks away from our embassy in London. He's been very generous to us, and he comes in and talks to our young diplomats. Um, and he shared with them this amazing story, which you all may know, but it didn't start out as Wikipedia. Do you know the story? So he goes out there. He calls it Newpedia. And this is the 90s, so everything is, so it's N-U, capital P, but one word. Remember when that was all the rage? So it was like Newpedia. And his model is almost what it is today with one important difference. He goes out and um, he's going to not pay anyone. That was always part of the model. Can you imagine being in that pitch meeting? I'm going to go beat Britannica, 300-year-old company. I'm going to go beat Microsoft, the richest company in the world with the best engineers and unlimited budget. And I'm going to do it and I'm not going to pay anyone anything. So he didn't have a lot of people excited about the project. But he said, you know what? Everyone's going to be gunning for me and because I'm the new kid on the block and I'm not paying anyone anything. So I have to be twice as paranoid about quality. So Britannica and um, uh, Encarta have like a five-step process to get an article approved. Jimmy's like, we're going to do 10. So he has 10 steps you have to get through to get an article done. A double peer-reviewed, I mean, it's very academic and rigorous and hard. So at the end of one year of Newpedia, they had nine articles. <laughs> nine. 
Jimmy's also good at math. He did some simple math, and there was just no way that was going to work. Oh, and by the way, one of his nine articles completely plagiarized through his double paranoid set of steps. Right, so then some young person on his team comes up and tells him about this thing called Wiki, right, where you can edit on the fly. And so, you know, the rest is history. He goes with that model. And it has become, and I hadn't heard this phrase before, but I love it, the greatest knowledge transfer engine in the history of the world, complete with a bunch of mistakes. Guess what? Encarta had a bunch of mistakes. Britannica had a lot of mistakes, but you're just not going to go reprint your whole bookshelf when you find a mistake. But it keeps getting better, and it keeps improving. And so I think the lesson I take from that is Encarta was digital. That's not what's so interesting. And we use that word digital. They were purely digital. What they weren't was networked. They didn't ask other people for help. They tasked people with assignments. And so I try to reflect that in my work at the embassy. And I just want to share with you three things that we're doing right now um, at the embassy, inspired by Jimmy and his joke and the other Jimmy and networked versus digital, and then open it up for suggestions and questions. Sound good? All right, so one thing I've done, trying to put this into practice, is I have been to 109 high schools all around the UK. I meet with 100 students at a time, or sometimes 200, um, in a, just almost exactly like this. And my hunch was, going into this job, that maybe British kids that age wouldn't be um, as supportive of the United States as the older generation. I mean, you could call them the 9-11 generation, but they were four, right? I mean, that's like asking me to get, have a deep resonance with the Vietnam War or the oil crisis in the 1970s. I knew it went on, but like it didn't, I have no resonance with it. Um, and maybe less clear memories about the Cold War and World War II and all that stuff. So I wanted to reach out and hear what's on these kids' minds. And um, so I did, and then it turns out that Pew, the wonderful people at Pew, just put out a uh, American opinion survey of what people all around Europe think of America. And in every single country but one, young people, sort of that age group, have a more favorable opinion of the United States than the older generation. And it's either like plus two or plus four percentage points, or in some cases, plus 14 percentage points higher, except for the UK, minus nine. So clearly, it hasn't been very effective. <laughs> but I got, but uh, that was a joke, which got no laughter. That was a sentence. Um, so, and my other hunch was, if you went and talked to 18-year-olds, as opposed to talking to people at universities, and when you go to universities and you get a group like this together, the people who show up, bless all of you and all of us, tend to be people really interested in foreign policy. So the questions, they want to talk about drones, and they want to talk about surveillance in Guantanamo Bay, and Afghanistan, and Iraq, and Yemen, and Syria, all these important things that we as diplomats are trained to talk about, we talk about every day, and so we're happy to engage. But I was like, do 18-year-olds, would, would they raise the same things? So I give them, I don't give them a lecture, I just give them a card, like this big, and a pencil, and I say, draw me a picture, please, of something that frustrates, concerns, or confuses you about the United States and what we're up to. And I always get a panicked look, usually from a young man who's like, I'm hopeless at drawing. I was like, you can just write a word if you want to write a word. So they do all that, and then we talk about it. And two-thirds, and then we write up what they wrote, and two-thirds of the issues they want to talk about aren't foreign policy at all. They're all what you would think of as domestic policy. The big one is guns, so half the kids draw a picture of a handgun. Police violence, racism, and, and, and. And they do get to drones, Guantanamo, that stuff too, but much less than these other things. So that was a big learning for us at the embassy around what to do there. Um, the other thing we tried to do is, early on when I got to the UK, I sat down, it was a sort of chamber of commerce kind of event, and I, I was all briefed up to get through my Senate testimony, and I know about our amazing investing relationship between the US and the UK, and we're each other's number one foreign direct investors, et cetera, et cetera. And so we're sitting at this business dinner, and this is this well-known British business guy sitting like two away from me, and I'm sort of pitching him on this, and I'm trying to get him excited to talk about transatlantic trade and investment partnership. 
uncleverly named TTIP. No hint of an A in there that it's transatlantic. But anyway, so I'm kind of pitching it. I'm basically saying, let's talk about this. And in a sort of nice way, he says, let's not. I was like, oh, OK. And then the conversation drifts on. And then he says, he sort of put his hand and he's like, he didn't say son, but you could t it was implied. Son, do you want to actually be helpful? And I was like, OK. Yes, I do. I mean, desperately. And he said, I'll tell you what you can do. I travel to your country five or more times a year. So he's a British passport holder. Five more times a year for business. Every time I show up, it's like they've never met me. It's inconvenient. It's in, and I could tell he wanted to open up. I mean, there, there had been lots of wine at this point. And he says, um, it's, 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 it's infuriating. And I had learned enough of British understatement to adjust for if he's willing to say infuriating and not, it's not overly convenient, it's actually infuriating. I was like, wow, OK. So I went and did a little digging. So I talked to my team at the embassy. And it turns out, and then we got to work. And it's taken us two years. But our quarter, Customs and Border Protection team worked with the equivalent over there called the UK Border Force. And they spent two years getting their systems to agree and talk to each other. So next, a week after next, we are announcing, we've already sort of announced it, um, that all UK citizens are now eligible for global entry. So instead of queuing up for what it can be, anyone gone through this? I mean, it can take, oh, yeah. at JFK when things are bad, I mean, it can be, so you wait in the passport line, that can be an hour. Then you think you're finally done, you get your bag, and then you have the customs line, where all your job is to give that one piece of paper, and that could be another hour. So now we're, it takes 45 seconds. Right? 45 seconds. So that's something. And so if you have British friends, if you are British, by all means, spread the word. So um, the final thing we did is we um, changed what was called protocol which is an important function at our embassy. Um, and we renamed it. We re-envisioned it. We hired a new group of people to do something different, which is to connect all the amazing networks. We've got law enforcement networks. We have economic networks, all these things. But to connect them all together, because the real power of the internet, remember, the internet used to be a verb back in the geeky old days of the 70s. It was internetworking. There were tons of computer networks. They just didn't talk to each other. So we renamed it the Office of Network Engagement to try to get all these different groups actually talking and engaging and not in their individual silos. And all of that I actually did because of the advice I was given by my boss, President Obama, before I left for Sweden. And I sat down in his office. I knew him from the campaign, but he had just been elected president. And I got to go meet him in the Oval Office. I was a little nervous. I put on my coat and tie. We didn't dress like this in the internet days. Put on my coat and tie, go in there, we chat for a little bit, and uh, we sit down. And I said, Mr. President, and that was just fun to say, you know, Mr. President, uh, I think it was maybe fun for him to hear too, because it was sort of new to him. What advice would you have for me as a first time diplomat? And I don't think he was really expecting it. And he sort of sat back in his chair and he said, well, Matthew, um, listen. And I was like, yeah, yeah, I was planning to. So I brought out my pen, and I used to have a little, like, the cool little moleskin little book. So I was like, waiting for his pearls of wisdom. But that's all he said. <laughs> and it took me a second. You guys are quicker. I just sat there like. And so, of course, his advice was, listen. Just listen. So I'm try I tried to do that in Sweden. I'm trying to do that in the UK. And what I've discovered so far is that if you listen, People hear you differently. And that seems like a good time to now open it up so I can listen to you guys and would welcome any suggestions and questions you all have. And I think we'll go into this format here. So thank you. Where would you like me? Oh, how nice. Mr. Ambassador, and that's fun to say too. Um, <laughs> I'm, no, I'm Matthew, that's the deal. Okay? <laughs> Just for this evening. Yeah, yeah. Um, we'll start with some questions from my colleague Alexis, uh, who teaches and works in this whole area of digital diplomacy. And then if I could ask people to sort of head towards the, uh, the microphone in the middle there, maybe around the five minute mark, and form an orderly queue, another English thing. 
And then we'll take a round of questions from the floor. That was, just quickly, that was one concern when we did that global entry, that queuing is a yes, national sure. excellence. I mean, you guys are amazing at queuing, and would I be, through that effort, slightly undermining yeah. your expertise in queuing? So just throw that out there. <laughs> yes, Alexis. Well, well, yes, no, I'm, uh, I'm really thrilled to be speaking with you right now. So as we spoke about earlier, and some of my students here know, I used to work for the State Department and for different ambassadors, and so I get a special thrill to be able to sit on a stage with an ambassador. Um, and so I wanted to talk about just a couple of uh, pieces of background before I got to the questions. And it's, I promise it's relevant and uh, hopefully not boring. Um, so You'll be the judge. <laughs> as we can tell from your speech tonight, you did not have an entourage of press officers and a script to read from. You are a high-level official, but you don't have a lot of the kind of trappings of traditional diplomats, as we might say. Um, and when I worked in government, when I worked at the State Department, I realized that th there really are just different kind of uh, ways of being for people in different positions of power. So there was the high-level officials, uh, and then there was the lower-ish levels, like me. Um, and it took a while to understand sort of how to be. So I wanted to just read off um, a couple of, uh, a, a quick quote from another former, uh, not that you're former, a former high-ranking official, uh, Robert Reich, who wrote this book called Locked in the Cabinet. And he talked about his experience of going from being uh, an advisor and a writer and a just kind of regular person to being a cabinet official. And he realized he didn't know how to act like a muck. And what he meant by this was a muckety-muck, an important person in government. So he figured out very quickly there were 10 rules of muckdom. And I just wanted to go over them very quickly. Um, all no, 10? All 10, very quickly, very sure. quickly. Yeah. Um, one, immediately hand off all your bags to somebody else <laughs> so your arms are free to do what you need to do. Uh, always go through the door first so that it doesn't look like a sign of weakness to let others go before you. Uh, should always walk fast and with purpose as if you've got somewhere really, really important to be. Um, to uh, dress the part, of course, no t-shirts and jeans. We all, you learn that your first day in the Oval Office. Um, to get in front of the camera so that people can see you being important and looking important. Uh, never to arrive early. In fact, best to arrive a little bit late for a speech so people think, oh my gosh, they've got really important things to do. They're gonna be uh, delayed. Um, when shaking hands, to do it really quickly and look sort of past someone so that you know that they're not gonna spend, then the muckety muck is not gonna spend a ton of time with you. Um, and uh, to d get to the last one is to defer to the higher mucks. So to respect the order of, of muckdom. Now one of the reasons I bring this up is that this was written in 1997. This was how diplomats, high level officials conveyed a sense of authority and this was sort of the expectation from the public that this was okay. This is what officials looked like. It's 2015. People now expect their diplomats, expect their politicians, political figures to be engaging on social media, reaching out, listening, um, and being real in some way. At the same time, you have very serious issues to deal with. As you said, in, especially in an audience like this, there's discussions of what to do about national security, what to do about ISIS, what to do about immigration, and all these other issues. Um, so my question is, how do you balance this in the digital era? where there's these expectations to be sort of official and serious and represent the country, um, but also to be real and authentic and mm. have the sense that you're not a muck above all the rest, but ready to engage with people. Thank you, and I love that list. That's excellent. <laughs> I, w I was almost late tonight, so I almost did at least one of them well. Um, I remember sitting early on with, um, Secretary Kerry, who comes through London fairly often, and, uh, and I was going to be in the car with him on the way from Stansted Airport back into London, and that takes a while, even with the police escort thing. So I was like, oh, well, this is fun. And he said, do you mind if I, I have to take a call? And he had two calls during our trip, and, and one was uh, to the Russian foreign minister, and one was with his Chinese counterpart. And I thought, oh, this is going to be fun. I get to hear sort of half the, you know, half the stuff. And at the end of the journey, uh, and the calls weren't that long, but 
And what I realized is I heard 10%. Why? Because he listened. He asked important, intense, open-ended questions. And he got long, really interesting um, answers, which I couldn't make out. Um, but, and I think that's a great, and so yes, he's at the top of the pyramid if you look at the world that way. I don't tend to look at the world like a giant pyramid, which by the way is what sort of the Encarta approach is just hierarchical versus this networked approach where you lead from the middle and you don't lead top down. A bunch of things do lend themselves to top down stuff, I'm sure. Everything I've done thus far, internet stuff, politics and campaigning and diplomacy, I think are much more a middle out way. We don't have a whiteboard here, but that's just sort of naturally how I think. Because people like to be listened to in private settings, in group settings, it's just, it works. Great. I think. So one other question, and this is for the students in the audience. I think there are many students in the audience. Um, a lot of people that come to Columbia, especially in the graduate program, hope for a career in government. And while we teach them here, we ask them to think about big policy ideas and really, you know, how do we innovate? How do we make government better? You know, how are we going to make big things happen? So when they get in government, most of them don't start at the position where they're a muckety-muck, where they're a top dog. They have to start somewhere um, at a little bit of a lower echelon to be a policy implementer, not necessarily a policy maker. So I was wondering if you had any advice for the students in the audience who wish to work in government but may not immediately get to the point where they're able to implement some of these big ideas they've been thinking about for years. I don't feel particularly qualified to give advice on that subject because I kind of got parachuted into this wonderful government <laughs> world twice from an outside world. So my colleagues at the embassy would, and do every day, give amazing advice to our young diplomats about um, how to do that. Um, I mean, I would just say, you know, policy making, I mean, I always draw three overlapping, see, now I have to self-medicate here and try. <laughs> Well, it's not going to work at this distance. But picture three overlapping circles, Venn diagram style. It's a great British guy, by the way, John Venn. Thankfully, did not patent his invention, or I would owe him lots of money. And forever <laughs> drawing Venn diagrams, like US, UK, or policy, which State Department's really good at, and sort of process. But there's that third one that overlaps process and policy, which is people. Like, people. Implement, people write, think up policy, they write it down, and then a whole bunch of people have to go live with what it's actually like with this policy. And as a young person, you can show up and ask them, what is it like to live with policy A, B, and C? They'll really be appreciative that you asked and that you listened and you took good notes. That's hugely valuable. Whilst people gather at the mic, and I would please invite you to do so to ask her the ambassador questions, perhaps I can... I can um, tease out one of the implications of the story that you were telling about the school kids. I mean, if you as an ambassador go to a school, which is a kind of fantastic activity, and apparently you've been to over 100, is admirable, um, and you ask them, expecting, as it were, the foreign policy agenda to emerge, and instead, essentially, a domestic policy agenda emerges, is that not kind of rather wrong footing as an ambassador? Because you're not as it were, responsible for domestic policy in the United States. Indeed, to a large extent, it, one could reverse the Kissinger quote. Who do you call about gun control in the US? Right? Because it is an, only in part a national level issue. It's in large part a state's rights issue. So the implication of what you were saying about these young people's awareness of the United States would seem to suggest, on the one hand, a closeness, that they care about the everyday lives of Americans that they identify, if you're talking to ethnic minority kids in Britain, they feel the direct identification with what's going on in Ferguson as one black young man to another black young man. Mm. But, but it would seem to be rather destabilizing. To, to, is it, do you perceive that as enabling or, or just an important piece of information to pass back to HQ or as something to work on in, oh, in uh, new Yes, ways? yes, and yes. Oh, yeah, okay, interesting great. to know, awkward to talk about really important to talk yeah. about. And so it's been fun to get my whole team trying to say, all right, well, we got to talk about guns because as much as it's not in our purview, we may think of it as domestic policy. It is foreign policy because of the 10,000 kids I've talked to, open-ended, half the kids do, as I mentioned, the exact same thing. So if we don't talk about it, they're talking about it. The encouraging thing is they are following the news. I know they don't read newspapers like some of us still do, but they are absolutely following all the news. And on. Um, 
and we looked because we've done this for two years and we keep all the data. And um, so the police violence one is very spiky. I mean, Ferguson, Tamir Rice in Cleveland, mm -hmm. Eric Garner in New York, all those things are really spiky. But guns was always number, I mean, you know, from day one until the one I did a few days ago. Um, but the point I try to make to them is, hey, um, because it's actually not states' rights as guns. I mean, that really is constitutional mm -hmm. at the federal level. Um, and, we, and they actually know a bunch about the Constitution, which is, makes it interesting. And I basically, and I'm not gonna do it here, but I basically tell the story. It's like, hey, in 1780, you know, we the people, we had a big fight with you guys, the British. You know, we wrote our Constitution down, unlike you guys, ha, ha, ha. Um, you guys. Um, <laughs> And then we talked through it, and they know a little bit about it. And I was like, we have certain freedoms. What do you think they are? And they kind of named them. And then um, and I said, but look, if we're honest with ourselves, who were we the people in 1780? It was we, the white, male, Protestant, landowning people. I mean, that's who. And then we gradually get rid of the religious requirement and the landowning requirement, and then we have our civil war. So I tell a story on the whiteboard from a small circle to a bigger circle, and then civil war, and then women's rights, and then civil rights. And I basically say, look, you guys are helping us, because as a country, um, we are at our best when we are humble enough to be self-critical. And the, we have to hear this frustrations from you guys and from within. And then at our best, we're confident enough to be self-correcting. And that's how come that circle keeps getting bigger. So thank you for talking about these things. Mm -hmm. Excellent. So we've now got a lovely long queue. Oh, gentlemen. Right. Hello, sir. My name is Sal Borgagnon. and I'm a foreign policy major here in CC. Speak up. Um, sorry. Um, so I was sitting down, I was brainstorming as like the really complex questions I could ask you that in regards to like foreign policy, drone strikes, Middle Eastern strategy. And you brought up this, these facts of gun policy, of you know, Eric Garner, of racism. What kind of image do you try to project of the United States to Britain, to people from Britain and to all those people you speak of? Because I was trying to think, you know, what does it mean to be American? And I, and I thought of some abstract things, but like, I'm, I'm trying to hear your opinion on this. Well, thank you for asking, because I forgot to say the happy part of that. So after we do all the, and we spend 85% of the time talking about the hard stuff. And then I say, flip over your card, draw me one picture of something that inspires you about America. And there isn't one big word like guns is on the negative side, but it's the word, but there is one that is the biggest, uh, which is opportunity. And technology and American dream and diversity, all that stuff kind of ties together. Um, because I also asked them, in what country do you think minorities are better treated? Because we do this whole thing with clickers, which I did, so they can anonymously answer. We asked them 10 questions. And uh, in what country do you think minorities are treated better? US, UK are both about the same. And I had no idea what the answer would be. And this is true, I've done about half the schools are majority minority, the other half are majority sort of white British. Um, it doesn't matter what school you're in. It's always basically 88% of the respondents click better in the UK, which is kind of interesting. But at the end of the session, you're, and you, you tell that expanding circle story, and then they're like, oh, yeah, yeah, right. You guys have come a long way. LGBT rights comes up a lot. And that that's a great thing to be able to talk about. Like, look how we, far we've come as a country in just 10 years on that issue. Thank you, sir. Yeah, thank you for your, uh, for your, you know, your speech. Um, I actually work with Alexis, um, and uh, so I'm really pleased to, to be here. Um, I won't ask you based on a list of 10 things, though, to start. <laughs> oh, yeah, okay. But um, I do have a question about, you mentioned the role of, uh, you know, kind of this, like, uh, networked uh, way by which information travels now. And, you know, one of the uh, features of that course is that, you know, via a network such as the Twitter network, for instance, if I have a Twitter account, I could, well, last week, I could have sent a message to any one of the Daesh accounts, um, or, you know, you having a Twitter account, you could technically, I know you wouldn't, but how does that impact, and this is going to be an open-ended question, so just have at it, how does that impact your mission as, you know, previously where the diplomat was the channel by which all communication officially from the US would reach a destination. Now you have the case where communication coming from the US or from any other country to another state or another group in the case of ISIS can reach that destination. 
And I mean, how does that add to challenges, but also how does that you know, add to features, so to speak, and enhance your capabilities? Yeah, it's something we struggle with. There's a colleague of mine at the State Department who you probably worked with. He has a new, uh, Dan Baer, who's our ambassador to the OSCE, wonderful um, young guy, was in the DRL before at the State Department. And he had a great thing. He, he did a presentation to fellow ambassadors around the use of social media. Because look, lots of our, my colleagues, it was kind of easy, like I was, um, look, it's easier for me because uh, I don't come from the, like my next career path isn't going to be within the State Department. So like worst case, I totally screw up, they fire me, like I'll be fine. But that's, you know, that's different if you're a 29-year-old foreign service officer coming up through the ranks. Like it's not fine if you make a big screw up. But the thing he said to these people that really stuck with me was, he's like, look, you're going to mess up. So do you want your stupid tweet to represent a quarter of all the work you've ever done. You send four tweets, one is bad. So volume really helps. So like, do 100 tweets, and then you have one dumb one. So you can sort of dilute it, which I think is very empowering. It's just like more, more. Now, then it raises the, the sort of Jimmy Carr sentence versus diplomacy. So you're trying to do like, but just more. Because look, our leaders, bless them, mess up all the time too. And they live to fight another day. They're fine. They get over it. That's what makes them good leaders. I mean, President Obama just gave that great interview to Bill Simmons. I don't know if you read that one, sports guy. Anyway, and he talks about that. So if our president could do it, if our secretary of state can do it, then we all ought to be able to do that too. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, again, thank you for your presentation. It was very enlightening. Um, so my question uh, relates to essentially the more digital nature of this presentation. Um, so my question essentially is, how is the U.S. State Department reacting to conflicts or controversies which uh, involve the use of cryptocurrencies, par particularly uh, like Bitcoins, um, especially given their widespread nature in sort of black market dealings, as well as their unrecognized uh, nature by uh, large uh, central governments and central banks? I don't know. <laughs> I know it's an emerge. I mean, it's a fascinating topic. It's moving quickly. It is a big deal. It's going to become an increasingly big deal, not necessarily big, but the whole. I just came from, a, we just sent a fintech delegation of, I think it was nine great British companies in financial tech, sending them, encouraging them to go grow their businesses here in New York and elsewhere in the States. And they went to Washington, they're in New York, they're in my beloved Boston tomorrow. Um, and one of, the, one of the companies deals with stuff in the happy part of that spectrum um, around new types of currencies, but it's not an area of expertise for me, so. Okay. Thank you. I don't. Can I just Thank interject you. for one moment and say how fantastic it was to hear uh, a diplomat of your stature say, I don't know, uh, <laughs> having worked in the State Department before. It's definitely not on the rules of Mukdam, I'm sure. Um, but I think that it's part of what establishes trust. As you were saying before, when you listen to people, they hear you differently. And when you acknowledge that you make mistakes or you don't know something, they're able to give you more credibility. So. Oh. I just wanted to acknowledge that. Thank you. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Uh, thank you. My name is Jennifer, um, and I'm a student at SEPA, and I'm actually one of uh, Professor Wachowski's students. Um, I have a question regarding kind of specific digital tools that you may be using at the embassy. I'm familiar with um, some of the digital tools that the Spanish embassy is using to engage youth populations. And I was wondering if you could speak a little bit more specifically about that, and are there any digital tools that have been really effective in, I guess, improving or perhaps bringing heightened understanding to the U.S. image, and particularly with respect to exchange between uh, U.S. citizens and citizens in the U.K.? I hope, thank you, I hope um, you will develop one. I mean, we need, I mean, we need, I think the really clever things, and I say this with love, I love my State Department, I think it's going to be clever people like you studying this and trying something that's going to really increase it. I mean, the big lesson is, like, it's not up to, I mean, we can think that people are waiting for us to go tell them stuff, but most of the time, you just want to get in the flow of the conversation that's already happening. I mean, I always do it, I give my Twitter handle and my private email address to all these 10,000 students I meet. But it's hilarious. I put up my email address. I was like, do you guys like email? They're like, oh. I mean, they hate email. It's like, that's what their teachers like bug their parents with. <laughs> so my Twitter, no, you know, and you know that. I mean, your generation's not probably hugely into Twitter either. I mean, the State Department, by the way, does an online knowledge something, you know, which is called Diplopedia. 
It's actually fine. But I thought, oh dear, that's exactly kind of 180 degrees from, it should be Wikiplomacy, right? Like the interesting thing is like open and growing and open to other people and some parts growing faster than others and controversy, like that's what's interesting about Wikipedia. But Diplopedia, like this, all the stuff we know stuck into a pedia, not all that interesting, I would argue. You're basically using Twitter and Facebook, presumably, and email, and I think this is where your question was headed. What are the things, what are the instruments you use? I mean, I use Twitter. Instagram. Our embassy uses, yeah, I, I mean, I personally uh, do Twitter. Um, Instagram's amazing. It's really good. I'm bad at it. I was told by my 14-year-old daughter. <laughs> She's like, oh, it's just pathetic. You do too much, and what you do, it's low quality. So then I got all precious and tried to do a few things. I just don't, I mean... It's not the thing for me. Um, I look forward to a day when each temperament can have their own tool that suits them. I mean, Twitter isn't really my thing either, by the way. Someone needs to develop another one for, um, I don't know. We had the first vice president of the EU commission here a couple of weeks ago, and he's behind you because he's still on Facebook and hasn't made it out to Twitter yet, as far as I can tell. So you're, yeah. you're, you may I mean, be behind Twitter, your daughter. At least Twitter. I mean, it's good for, there was this, um, uh, this great former foreign service officer who I sat down with. I, I, sorry, I don't want to go on. I want to hear your questions. Okay. okay. Um, so hi, my name is Kritika. I'm also a first year student at SIPA. Um, so my question is also in regards to social media and its tendency to make people and organizations um, perhaps express their views in, uh, in a more extreme way than they usually are uh, in reality. So when you have 140 characters, you can't really go into nuances of an issue. Um, and with diplomacy being such a inherently subtle and nuanced kind of um, work, um, do you find it challenging to be authentic to the work that you're doing on social media? And the follow-up question to that is also, um, how do you measure the effectiveness of digital diplomacy? Um, do you know, do you, are you actually reaching people? Um, you know, do you measure the number of tweets you get back after you go visit a group? Um, do you have any measurements that you use? Sure, maybe the second part yeah. first. We do, and it's nice about all these platforms, Facebook, Twitter, they have great analytics stuff. I'm sure you guys use them. It's really, um, uh, you can really track it. My grandfather, Barson, who was referenced earlier, has this great line, I don't remember which book, I bet my aunt does. I won't put you on the spot. But he has this great point, he's making this, I think, in the 1950s. And he says, um, to be really careful about things where they are precise, but not accurate. <laughs> And there's a level of precision with all this online stuff that's amazing. It's unclear whether it's accurate in the biggest stuff. But in the meantime, the precision is helpful and better than nothing. Um, and now I forgot the first part of your question. Uh, it's, um, so I, I, the first part was with tweets and social media, you really want to be snappy. And with 140 characters, it's hard to oh, yeah. delve into nuance. Yeah, um, it probably is not great for nuance. Although I would say in my previous life as a volunteer fundraiser in 2007, um, I'm an introverted guy, in an ex and fundraising typically is sort of an extroverted function, typically, but I happen not to be, and I was uh, determined to try as hard as I could. So I hate talking on the phone, and I really don't want to go out and have coffee with people I've never met and ask them for money. I was raised in New England, told never to talk about money or politics or religion, and I had to talk about three, two, sometimes three of those things all at once. So I actually used email, and so I raised all the money I raised, without ever making a phone call, without ever taking anyone out to coffee, and without ever sending a bulk email. And this is the worst thing. You guys don't do it because you're too smart. But like, dear friend is dear delete. Yeah. I mean, why would you ever answer? I mean, it's the easiest thing to say, nope, nope, nope. But you can actually get real nuance. And we used to study this in my CNET days. Like, email can be an intimate form of communication. You know, hey, John, great to see you last night. I hope Jill's like, oh, gosh, it's really you. And I know we don't write each other letters anymore, but email properly done, thoughtfully, authentically done, is really nuanced and powerful. And writing back, this is the other thing for young people in government, mm -hmm. write people back quickly even though you don't have an answer. It is amazing how happy people are. You don't have to have it figured out because it'll take forever and you're not the one who could figure it out anyway because you have to wait for your boss, which mm -hmm. will take even longer. So just say thank you. And you would, the, so many positive points to be done there. Thank, Thank you. you.
Hi, Mr. Ambassador. Uh, on Matthew. The, Matthew. <laughs> Matthew. Uh, in the Times article that came out about what you were doing in the schools last week, uh, there were two word charts, and one that was uh, about the problems that students saw in the U.S., and the other was that uh, things that they admired about the U.S. And what I noticed is that in the word charts, the problems were a lot more specific than the things that people actually admired, which were like technology and food and the driving age. Um, so I was wondering what your thoughts were on the specificity, uh, you know, between these two issues. Yeah, we looked at it. You know, on the negative side, we color-coded all the foreign policy things blue and all the domestic stuff red and on the, for the big word cloud. And then on the other side, we did, which didn't work as well, but we did gray for things you could touch or eat or so movies, food, that kind of thing. And then we did... I think red for just sort of intangible but really important things like diversity, opportunity, that stuff. And so it's more red than gray in that world. But it isn't um, as, I think opportunity is really the key thing, that it's just a place you can try things. Um, that's really powerful. Um, and the ability to be, like I said, self-correcting. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much for coming tonight. Matthew. <laughs> um, I'm a PhD student in Alexis's class, and she often discusses risk aversion culture within the government and, you know, some of the negative consequences that occur when a risk goes poorly. I come from a tech background, as do you, where, you know, fail faster, fail harder, take the risks, and then you talk about them and you champion them as no, um, knowledge. So at the risk of blending diplomatic and tech cultures now, could you discuss a risk that you take, took that didn't go well and how you managed that risk and the failure. Yes, I mean, I remember when I, when I got to, so I did it once in Sweden for two years and then I had, I had a bunch of learning there and I was eager to, when I got to London, um, really push, not at first on the risk just because I knew the culture. I was like, why don't we celebrate wins more? You know, like we work really hard on stuff and that everyone just does a great job like Secretary of State visits, like that's a ton of work. And very few people actually get to be in the room with them. It's all this hidden amount of work, people lugging bags, people driving cars, it's awesome. And it's hugely impressive. In Sweden, he or she, never, you know, I never, we never did that scale of visit. And, and so we started making, I started making these big movie posters and I lined the hallway. It used to be filled with like pictures of dead white men all along the hallway. I'm like, we have plenty of portraits of that everywhere else in the embassy. Let's clear those out, reorder them in some nice way and clear it up for like celebrating what we actually do together every day. So we had this wonderful woman who made the posters for us um, and everyone who worked on it, whether they were in the room or way, had their name, just like on a movie poster at the bottom, and they were kind of silly and they were based on you know, real movies of the day. And it was kind of fun. Um, as a small way of recognizing the win to try to give a little bit more room for uh, failures. Um, and so I did a... Um, I got everyone in the embassy through a workshop, like 50 people at a time, the mission of our mission, and we did a bunch of stuff, and I talked about Wikipedia versus Encarta, blah, blah. and then I tried to do these sessions where we would share failures. And I will just tell you that the sharing of failure was a failure. <laughs> and this brilliant man who just retired from the Foreign Service took me aside, he was head of our political unit, brilliant guy, served all over the world, and he sat me, he was about to leave, and I was like, he's like, I, you know, thanks for trying. Um, <laughs> And he said, but I'll tell you something. Um, he said, we have wins. I know you did your posters, that's fine. I don't think he thought they were that cool, but he was like, they're fine. We celebrate wins too, and they're worth like 10 points. When we screw up, it's minus 1,000. And until you change that math, you can put up as many posters as you want, and no one's gonna really wanna talk about failure. I thought that was, I mean, you lived it. Um, that's, I think, a really interesting challenge. And I said, okay, but before you leave, should we try to make wins worth more or failures worth less if you have to change that math? And he said, failures, less, less of a penalty. Um, so that's a challenge I still have. I haven't figured it out. It's a failing of mine in my small world. There's no limited liability in foreign policy. I hope that's not a lame answer, like I work too hard. <laughs> I tried too much. I'm a perfectionist in the interview. I've, uh, I feel like I have lots of more things I've failed at. Uh, but I think that it's an excellent point, though, that it's not just that the failures count 
a lot in a person's individual career if this is their whole career, but that the stakes are so high in some instances. Well, that's it. And to, and to be clear. In diplomacy, yeah. Yeah, like, I mean, and maybe we need a better language around, like, a lot of these people I work with, it's like, if you screw up, like, people die. Right? And a lot of people are coming to London from Baghdad, um, from Afghanistan, from really intense places, for, and other that, are, that aren't those two places that are really intense, too. But if you bring that life or death mentality to a whole sphere of things that really just aren't life and death, so how do you make that balance? That's yeah. a Thank good you. challenge. Thank you. We'll take these two more questions. Okay. Hi, my name is Susie. I came from China, first year student at SIPA. I have two questions for you. And first is, I remember that during the campus tour in UK, I remember that you ask each student a question that is what frustrated and concerned you most about United States. So I was wondering, what is your answer to that question? <laughs> oh, that's really good. <laughs> What's your second one? <laughs> <laughs> okay, my second one is, uh, we know that prior to uh, ambassador to Sweden and the UK, uh, you were one of the top fundraisers, small dollar fundraisers, back to President Obama's campaign. I was wondering, can you share a little bit about that experiences, and does that experience help you to realize that engaging grassroots is particularly important? That's it. Um, thank you. I mean, on the first one, I just have to be boring. I can't do that. I made a very, oh, here's a failure. So the first, uh, in my first year, um, and they put you through media training, and you're never supposed, the last question is always the hardest. A good journalist way, you're like getting ready, you're taking off your microphone or whatever. And they're like, oh, just one more thing. So I've been warned. So this wonderful, great journalist uh, is doing some piece, and so she asked me, well, one thing you'd change about the UK, you know, sorry, one thing you don't, you know, one thing you like about the UK. I'm like, oh, you know, I have like 10. You know, one thing you don't like. I'm like, oh, no, I'm a diplomat, I'm not falling for that. So I think it's over. She's like, okay, I mean, one thing you could change if you could. And then I stupidly, <laughs> stupidly turn. I'm feeling kind of good. I think I've done a good job with the interview. So I turn, I was like, oh, well, one thing, you know, lamb and potatoes, my goodness, they've served that at every, I must have had it 180 <laughs> times in my first year. You know, there are limits and I've reached them. I think nothing of it, I walk up the stairs. So the whole, that one line got reprinted on the front, like Daily Mail, Sun, like it just went, like viral in the most awful way. So we had like Lambgate. And, it's like, what? and I'm like, I don't, and I don't even really hate lamb and potatoes. I just would, but I mean, rule number one, like don't criticize your host nation's food. <laughs> rule number two, you know, don't criticize your home country on home turf here. So I can't do the, uh, the first part. I mean, I'm like fundraising, I think I did sort of share the idea about, um, uh, I mean, it gets back to that sort of triangle versus, um, well, I remember early on when I did fundraising, I, um, I was at a, um, uh, uh, some, this guy was going to host an event. So he invited 40 people to a cocktail party to help. It's all volunteer fundraisers, right? So it's like a bunch of couples. Um, so let's say 20 couples, and then we had four weeks till the event happened. And on the third week, you know, a bunch of people had dropped off. Second week, a bunch of people dropped off, and we all get together the day before the event's gonna happen. At this point, it's just down to 10 of us who are actually doing the work. And he comes around the table, and he says thank you to everyone, because we worked really hard. We'd already hit the goal we were supposed to do. We're all feeling kind of good. And so he goes around the table, gives everyone a present, and I'm sort of last, because I'm, you know, he gives it. And he gave every single person the same present, which was a necktie, and I was the only man at the table. <laughs> And he didn't seem concerned by this. <laughs> and so that was kind of a lesson, like, oh my goodness, how weird that you can just assume in advance that everyone's gonna be someone who wants to wear a tie. Just, you know, make sure, I hope Steve enjoys it or whatever. <laughs> Steve didn't do anything. Steve came to the cocktail party, didn't lift a finger. <laughs> so I think including people and don't assume you know who's gonna do a lot of the good work because you probably don't. Thank you so much. Thank you. Mr. Ambassador, sorry, that's really fun to say. Um, thank you very much for coming. Um, we, with regards to um, the special relationship in China, um, China in recent years and months has been launching something of a charm offensive in Britain and has been meeting with some success. I mean, recently um, Britain joined the China, Chinese-led um, Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank over US opposition. Um, and very recently, David Cameron feted um, Xi Jinping um, in a British pub over beer, um, 
quite publicly, and they've proclaimed um, a new age of Sino-British cooperation, was I believe what came, came of that. Considering the, um, the worrying potential for an emergent geopolitical rivalry between the United States and China, um, how do you see this potentially affecting the special relationship? Is this a, just a nominal rapprochement or is it potentially material and what do you believe should be done um, about that? Thank you. I was practicing, I don't know if you noticed, there's this great, you try to do this diplomatic nod which is slow enough that you're saying, <laughs> you're saying, you're saying I hear you, but not so fast that it's I agree with you. So I was trying out, um, try it sometime. Um, no, but thank you. Look, and I think this has been written about a bunch on both sides of the Atlantic. I mean, from the United States perspective, it's pretty clear. I mean, we welcome the peaceful rise of China. We're huge. I mean, we have a great, I mean, President Xi had just been to Washington for a great and very productive visit. Um, so we welcome that rise and we welcome our allies and we have no closer one than the UK having a really productive and constructive relationship with China. Um, so in the case of AIIB, I mean, the UK tends to make anything it's part of better which is one of the reasons when asked about UK's relationship with and within Europe, we say, hey, it's up to you guys, but if you ask us as friends from a selfish perspective, yes, it's better for us if you guys are in it because you make everything you're part of better. And we know that because we sit next to you on the UN Security Council, NATO, OSCE, you name it. We know what UK brings to every organization. And so we welcome um, the strong uh, relationship that the UK has with China. We've got one, we agree on a whole bunch of stuff, we're deeply economically, we disagree on a whole bunch of stuff, right? Um, human rights, and we're not afraid to say it publicly, we're not afraid to say it privately, and so, um, so we welcome. So it has nothing to do with the special, I think it's an example of the special relationship. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. Ambassador Matthew, we've run a bunch of uh, events this fall, um, but I think there's any question at all that this has been the most engaging and certainly the event most uh, widely attended by young people on campus who ask the most engaged questions that we've heard all term so far. So thank you so much for being with us this evening. It's enormously appreciated. Thank you. Thank you guys so much. <laughs>